Well, again, we are so, so grateful that you are here with us on this Easter morning. Beautiful day, beautiful time to see something like this. It's incredible to see how the cross, this instrument of death, is actually transformed visually for us into something that represents life. For those of you who don't know me, my name's uh, Chris. I have uh, been here for uh, not quite a year yet, but I've really enjoyed just learning this church and learning this community. Um, some of you have gotten to know me a little bit over the course of these last seven or eight months, but for those of you who don't, you'll find out really quickly if you get to know me, there are certain things that instantly I'm known for. I'm, I'm not a quiet person, I'm, I'm, I'm a loud person, and I recognize that. I'm self-aware. I like to talk because I like people. So the first thing you learn about me is this, is that I'm an extrovert. An extrovert is someone who gets energy from being around people. So like this where all of you are sitting there listening to me is like my favorite dream in the world, right? That, like, I love people, I love parties, I love being around people. That's one thing people know me by. The second thing people know me by is I love to travel. Oh my goodness, to see the world, I just, anything that gets me to a new environment, a new climate, a new kind of culture, I just want to eat that up. So I love that. The other thing, and this is one that most people who really know me know my obsession about is sports. You know, I, I do. I, I'm one of those guys. I love sports. If you're asking which sport, the answer is yes. All of them, right? Like, I, I love sport. I just enjoy that kind of thing. So it was really interesting about eight or nine years ago when I developed a new hobby that seemed to be the antithesis of all those things put together because, you see, what happened with me, I was going through this weird season, a season of personal drought. You've been in seasons like that. Nothing on the surface looks wrong. It's just, ugh, you're feeling like you need something. And what I realized I needed was a hobby. And guess what? Watching sports isn't really a hobby. And being around people, that's not really a hobby. I needed something to do. Part of what my job entails is, well, guess what? When I do Sunday morning like I'm doing here, it feels good. But guess what? Sunday's coming the next week. So there's almost a cyclical pattern about the job, right? I love what I do. There's always new challenges. But I needed something where I felt like I could see something coming together, that satisfying feeling. And building Legos with my son wasn't enough for that. And so what I developed was something people found so odd and still do about me when they get to know me. It was gardening. Oh my goodness, I love to garden. And when I talk about gardening, I'm talking about vegetable gardening because I also like to eat. So if I'm going to grow something, I want to later consume it. And so I developed this hobby where I would put my hands in the dirt and I tried it for a while and discovered man it is so satisfying it was so different from who I was because I'm not with people like the extrovert part of me I am in solitude by myself I'm not going somewhere new I'm in the same place day in and day out and I'm not seeing instant gratification like I do after two or three hours of a game. I'm watching something very slowly come together. It was awesome. I remember the first time I harvested anything, and it wasn't a lot. I was so proud of it. And I'm telling you, there's nothing that tastes better than something you grew yourself. I don't know if that's actually factual. I just feel like it is, right? But, oh, what a satisfying feeling. I remember as I started studying, and there were so many gardeners out there who had wonderful green thumbs who helped coach me and show me different methods, that the one thing they always told me when they saw me with my plot is they told me that the importance of a proper spacing, right? Because you want to get as much yield as possible, and you think that what you need to do is kind of squish everything together, but what they warn me about is that if you put plants too close together, it will steal the life-giving nutrients. You really need to give them adequate space to grow and to thrive. And so if you saw my garden today, my main garden is 25 by 12 feet. It takes up almost half of my backyard, and then I've got little other things. I mean, I'm really serious about what I grow, right? And my kids are in it. We love it. I need that kind of space to grow the amount I want because I need adequate spacing. I've learned that the hard way because, see, in my old place, when I used to live in New York, I had a very small plot. And because it didn't have a lot of room for me to grow the plants I want, and there's nothing I like to grow more than tomatoes because I love Italian food, and when you make your own Italian food, mm, nothing like it, right? So I have this plot, and, and I'm going, man, I, I can only get about four plants there. But 
you know, when you put the seeds and you start to grow them, it looks like, man, I could easily squeeze 12 plants in here. What are they talking about? And so what I did is I thought I know better because, of course, I decided to plant over double what I was supposed to. I crowded the plants together. And you know what? I thought I had them fooled at first because when I saw them start to grow, they were the first month or two, it was like, <laughs> these are doing well. They look healthy. They look beautiful. But you see, they were still in their infancy. They were still growing. Because one thing about a proper tomato plant is they're going to get pretty high. You're going to have to tie them to spikes. You're going to have to help them grow upward. You're going to have to prune them properly. And so as they started to grow, there came a point where they stopped growing. And then it looked like some of the fruit was dying. And then it looks like some of the fruit was dying prematurely or not developing at all. And ironically, this thing that I had invested so much energy and time in became something that actually stole from the purpose it was meant to give. It wasn't a place of life, it was a place of death, right? Because the plants couldn't produce what they were originally intended to. It's Easter Sunday morning. And when I look at what our faith is all about, maybe you're here today and you have been in this faith your whole life. Or maybe you're today and you're like so many of the people who this faith talks about in its original story. You're, you're here to hear. You're here to see. You are most welcome. One of the things about the Bible story is it really centers around two gardens. On one garden, it was meant to be a place of life. It was meant to be a place where we, as creatures created in God's unique image, were meant to not only have life, but have a vocation that produced further life. But see, what happened was, because of our selfishness and because of our, you know, arrogance and because of our sin, we decided to go our own direction. And when we went a direction that was actually not healthy for us, the choices we therein made choked out the life that it was meant to bring in us and ironically and paradoxically became a place of death. But you see, here's the beautiful thing. We could not get ourselves out of that situation. There is another garden, and in this garden, which ironically is a place of death, because among other things in this garden, there were tombs. If you know anything about tombs or graveyards, you don't go there to hunky-dory, have a happy day, or have a picnic. You go there because you're mourning, you're grieving. It's a place where we bring the dead, and it's a place where we say our final goodbyes. It's a place of death, but you see, in this garden where death was meant, life, new life emerged. And it's in between these two gardens that we find the story of the Bible reach its ultimate climax. And so here we are 2,000 years later, and we're learning about these two gardens. On this side, there was a woman. And in this story, the woman, because of a choice she made, because she was deceived and led astray, birthed something that is a seed that exists in every one of our hearts. It's something called sin. And if you're sitting here today saying, I don't know if I buy the sin thing, just turn on the news. Because our world is not getting better with all our advancements, all our medications, all our, you know, philosophies and statements and social media posts to one up the other one. Listen, let me tell you something. The world's not getting better. The world is getting worse. In the 20th century, there was something called humanism. They thought that the world, we have advanced so much that we no longer need God. We don't need concepts like religion. And then two world wars killed more people than the 20 centuries all combined prior. We're not getting better, church. We're getting worse. And I think it's because there's this seed in every one of us that produces selfishness and evil. And we look at ourselves and we look at others and go, how does this happen? Maybe there's something that produced death in this first garden. But see, in the other garden, there's another woman. She's kind of a spiritual representative, isn't she? She's someone who will discover a new level of life. And her journey is the one all of us ultimately need to make if we're to discover how to eradicate and reverse the realities of this first garden. We're talking about a woman named Mary Magdalene. She's a fascinating person, a fascinating character in the study of the Bible. We know very little about her story. We know this about her. 
The Bible tells us that at some point she had evil spirits in her, and Jesus, as he did when he encountered everyone, cast those things out. And because she was made whole and clean and new again, out of her devotion and gratitude, she became a follower of Jesus. There were actually female disciples who followed Jesus. They were those who provided for Jesus. They had a special relationship. When Jesus was arrested, all but one of the apostles fled the scene, but I'll tell you who was there at the foot of the cross. It was the women, and Mary Magdalene was one of these. She was as devoted as she possibly could have been. She might have been arrested, tried as one of her disciples. She didn't care. She loved him that much. So here it is. It's been three days. He died on Friday, and at the crack of dawn on Sunday, she's coming back to the tomb. We're not entirely sure why she went. Maybe she wanted to anoint his body with more spices. That was kind of a common practice in Israel during the time. But the problem was is they don't put people in the ground. They put people in caves, and in front of a cave, there's this giant rock that is rolled into this crevice that holds it into place and she knows she can't get into the tomb by herself so she goes there not really knowing who's going to roll the stone away for her but she just wants to be near Jesus and it's just a beautiful expression right that kind of a beautiful devotion that just wants to be near him and the story picks up here in John chapter 20 verse 1 it will be on the screen behind me and I'm going to read it out loud if you don't have the Bible there in front of you But listen to what happens next. We've been in this series called Encountering Jesus. And over the past month, we've talked about how different people, when they encountered Jesus, had their lives altered in significant ways that they never walked away the same way as when they came. But the encounter that Jesus brings when he sees them always came with a question. Jesus would ask a probing question. And today, we're going to look in this final message about the question that Jesus, but it's a different Jesus, this is the resurrected Jesus, asks Mary that each and every one of us need to ask ourselves when we come to the empty tomb. Here's where the story takes us. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came, running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen laying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter came along beside him and went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went inside. He saw and he believed. They still did not understand from the scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. And the disciples went back to where they were staying. Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not recognize that it was Jesus. He asked her, woman, why are you crying? Who is it that you are looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabbi, which means teacher. Jesus said, Do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. So Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news. I have seen the Lord. And she told, them that they had, she told them that he had said these things to her. There are so many people in our lives that we know about. If you count them up, it would take years just to make it all in your head. I'm not just talking about people you encounter. There are so many people we know about that you will never ever able, be able to meet. These are celebrities, these are musicians, these are athletes, these are figures. Isn't it funny that there are so many people that are household names in our lives that we will never meet? And they carry incredible significance. 
This can be anything from like a Tom Cruise to a George Washington to a Babe Ruth to an Oprah Winfrey to a Julius Caesar to a Babe Ruth. We all know those names. Those are household names, but you've not met any one of them. At least I'm guessing you haven't met any one of them. Household names are incredible, and usually they are incredible because of the accomplishments or the accolades that have been connected to them. There are so many of them that we know and have memorized in the back of our head. We see a picture of them, and they automatically come to our head. But the people I find that are household names that are most interesting and most unique are the ones who never really should have been household names. They weren't people who were born with a golden spoon in their mouth. They weren't people who had talents that were bringing them up. They just happened to be unlikely heroes, finding themselves at the right place at the right time. When I think of unlikely household names, I think of figures like Rosa Parks or Mother Teresa. But you know who my favorite one is? It's Terry Fox. I think he's probably the most important Canadian who ever lived. Terry Fox tragically died at a very young age, and most of us know the story. Some of us remember when Terry Fox was running back in 1980 when he had that tragic diagnosis of cancer, and he had to lose a leg. And part of what we don't remember about the story is that early in his race, it didn't have the accolades that we like to think it did. He wasn't remembered. He was trying to raise $1 for every Canadian, a mere $24 million for cancer research. Yet in spite of the challenges and obstacles and lack of accolades when he started, the more he faithfully did it, the more he went along the track, the more attention he got. He did not get halfway across Canada like his goal was set out to be before he had to quit the race. But did you know that as of last year, the Terry Fox Foundation has raised over $850 million and climbing for cancer research? Who among us would not declare that Terry Fox is a significant individual and a household name? But it was kind of by accident, wasn't it? Kind of tragic. Not someone that you would necessarily think. The reason I'm telling you this is because Mary Magdalene is that to me in the Bible. There are all kinds of people who could have met Jesus Christ for the very first time. The resurrected Christ. The glorified Christ. It's not a king. It's not a religious priest. It's not a famous individual or a prophet. It's not one of his 12 apostles. It's not Peter, James, or John. It's not his family. It's this woman who we know very little about. And I'm going to tell you why I find this significant. It's a little bit of a side as to what I'm, want, what I'm wanting to kind of wrap up and talk about here today. But this is what you need to know about the ancient world. And the ancient world doesn't really jive with our values today. But women weren't seen as much value. Their witness was not considered credible. And so if you were inventing the story of the resurrection... Who would you invent be the people who encountered the resurrected Christ first? It would be men. That's just the reality of the day. And yet every single one of the gospel accounts declare that the first, the first, the first individuals to encounter the risen Christ were women. Why is that significant? Because if you were making it up, you would have put priests or kings or at least men but the fact that they report that women came when their testimony was not seen as valid has to indicate that it happened it happened and so Mary finds herself at the tomb this day see Mary was a devout follower of Jesus she's devastated at his death and she's just wanting to be near him even if she thinks that the man inside the tomb is dead. But when she arrives and sees the tombstone rolled away after she sees it, she goes and reports to Peter and John. And after they come and look themselves and walk away, she decides in the midst of her tears to stoop into the cave herself and take a look and look inside the tomb to see for herself. And that's the very first thing I want to invite you to do here today is to draw near to the tomb and take a look for yourself. It's the first most important lesson from her life, to come and see, to look closely at the resurrection. Like Mary, the call of Easter is for you and I, whether you are a seeker, whether you are a skeptic, whether you're devoted, to come, move closer, and look at the empty tomb. Here's the thing, I, too many people hear the claims of Jesus and never take the time out of their entire lives 
to really critically, historically look at the resurrection. Many of us think that it's a good lesson. It's good morality. Maybe it happened. Maybe it didn't. But let me tell you something. If Jesus actually rose from the dead, there's absolutely nothing more significant in your life. I don't care who you are. I don't care what you've done. I don't care what the future looks like. If you're considering that Jesus may be who he claims he could be, nothing is more significant or important than you take the time to stoop like Mary to make a move and look for yourself to see if the claims are true. I have found in my life, and I'm not just talking about because the Bible says, that the more I study the critical look at Jesus, those who say he did not rise, those who deny him, and when I look at the historicity for myself, and I look at the alternative claims, what I find is not an empty tale, but an empty tomb instead. And what I believe is this, the God who raised him from the grave will raise your hearts to new life when you take the honest time to look and see for yourself. Mary comes in. She sees an empty tomb. Maybe you're coming here today and that's not your issue. You already, you already buy that. You already believe that. But there's something about Easter that just kind of feels like another holiday. It's like, okay, when is the ham done? When are we going to have our farmer's sausage? Like, like when are we just going to go do the next thing? And the second crowd I want to talk to is the distracted crowd. Because, see, Mary comes in, and it's so fascinating that what she encounters is angelic figures sitting there, and Jesus behind her, and yet in the midst of her grief, in the midst of her tears, she's too distracted in spite of the amazement and wonder of what's going on here, to see what is actually going on. See, in her distraction and in her focus, she is looking at the wrong thing and missing potentially the fullness of what is happening here until Jesus speaks a word to her. Um, I pastor another church in Richmond, and last month there was a break-in at that church. And what happened was, we think after we investigated um, that because we have a gymnasium attached to our church and because there's people in there every single evening doing some activity or some game that, you know, when you get a big group of guys in there and they're playing, the sweat, the heat kind of gets too much and so they prop the door open to let some air circulation come in. And what we've discovered is that unless you take those doors and, and really pull them, they won't necessarily latch. And what we think happened is that someone propped the doors open and in doing that played their game and got distracted from all the activities and had a good time and left and accidentally because of the distraction allowed something to stay open that allowed people to come in from the outside and steal some equipment and some finances and some sporting wear. Mary, after she sees the empty tomb the first time, isn't excited. She's terrified, and so terrified that she runs off to report to Peter what had happened. Her fear is that someone had stolen Jesus from the tomb, maybe one of those who had him crucified, one of the chief priests, because they wanted to desecrate what to her was so sacred. And you can imagine her in this moment. You and I would probably feel something similar if we had that sort of love for Jesus in this moment. The thing, though, here is, is that Jesus had told her and the other disciples long before that this was bound to happen, that one day she would raise from the dead. She is just too distracted in the moment because of her grief for her to remember it, which leads me to this next question for you today. Who has stolen Jesus from you? Who's stolen Jesus from you? Who in your distraction because of your busy lives or because of your other priorities has taken this all-important, significant event from your heart? Let me tell you something, church. If this is true, if Jesus rose from the dead, nothing else matters. <laughs> nothing else matters. Christian today, especially to you, you should be overwhelmed with joy and gratitude and thankfulness because Jesus Christ, who bore our sins on the cross, not only took that to the grave, but he had the 
power to raise himself from the dead. He is not dead. He is risen. He rules and he reigns. He reigns in heaven and he reigns in our heart. Church, today Easter reminds us that he is alive, that his significance in you is to produce and bring the kingdom of God in our city, in our province, in our country, and in our world. Nothing else matters by that reality. But here's the truth. Some of us are coming here today, and we know the songs, and we've seen the ceremonies. We've done the flower thing before. It's cute. It's nice. It's beautiful. But it doesn't move us. Let me tell you today, the call of Easter, what Mary reminds us of today, is that our distractions can sometimes keep us from seeing the most significant thing that could ever happen in the world and in our personal lives. She can't see it. She's scared. She's grieving. The solution for those realities will only come when she's able to see Jesus personally. Until then, her mind remains on the problem of the empty tomb. But this is where Jesus comes into the story, and in doing so, will lift her to a different reality. It's also where he asks the question that we've been looking at all month. Woman, why are you crying? Who is it you are looking for? Church, who are you looking for this morning? Who are you looking for this morning? Is today a holiday for you? Is it a tradition? Is it an obligation because someone asked you, please come to church today. It would mean a lot for you to come to Easter. And I understand that. And listen to me. We are so grateful that you are here. But listen to me. Who is it that you're looking for today? Maybe you came in here looking for one thing, but here in this moment, all of a sudden, there's a new curiosity that is piquing your interest. Who is it that you are looking for here? If you do not ask that question, you may miss the one who is here in our midst, just like Mary did in that first moment. She is so devastated by her loss, she isn't able to see him for who he is until he asks her this question. And we see Mary turns around. It's the simplest sermon in the world. She asks, who stole the body? And he just says, Mary. The Bible says when Jesus is preaching that a shepherd is who Jesus is. It's what he represents. And his sheep know his, him by his voice. They know him by name. And so in this moment, Jesus just utters the word. It's her name. And in that name, she realizes and recognizes it is Christ. And he is risen. And it's so exciting. Imagine you saw the risen Christ today. You know what I'd want to do? I just want to park there. Have you ever had a moment of spiritual ecstasy where you're in worship and you're just like, oh Lord, I don't want to leave this room. I just want to park here. Let's just keep doing this and doing this and doing this. Here's the thing though. Eventually you have to move. You have to move on. Jesus loves Mary very dearly and it's evident Mary loves Jesus. She wants to hold on to Jesus tightly. Jesus says, no, Mary, you can't hold on to me forever because I need you to actualize the mission that I have redeemed you for and called you for. The church here in this scene starts with one person. Mary Magdalene will be the first one to declare, I have seen the risen Christ. You want to know what an apostle is? In the Bible, an apostle is someone who has seen the risen Christ. Mary Magdalene is called the apostle to the apostles. I'm sure she's a little disappointed in this moment. Because wouldn't you just want to stay there with Jesus? And Jesus loves her for that. But he says, you can't cling to me. Now you have to go. And you have to tell people what you have seen and what you've experienced. About 17 years ago, I was training to be a pastor. I was at a Bible college in New Brunswick, and I was coming to the end of my studies. And there was this professor that I loved very dearly. His name was John Simons. He was semi-retired, and he had been a successful second career pastor. He was everything you could want to emulate in a minister. He was humble. He was talented and gifted, a fantastic preacher. 
And he took a small country church in Yarmouth, Nova Scotia. Yarmouth, Nova Scotia is on the very tip. It's where the highway literally ends, <laughs> okay? So you go to Yarmouth. He goes to a church of 50 people, wants to devote a life's ministry there over 25 years, sees the church grow to about 800 people in the town of 10,000. I mean, it was just remarkable what happened. And there's nothing flashy about him. There's, he's quality, he's devoted, but he just has a pastor's heart. There's no one I want it to be like more than John Simons. I wanted to learn from him. And so when I took his courses, I took notes not because I needed to take them for a test. I took them because I wanted, I cherished those. I wanted to hold them dear because that's the kind of pastor I want to be. Nothing I wanted to learn from him more than how to preach. And I remember when he started our preaching courses, he would teach us his methods. He would open the scripture and he would, what he said, soak in the scripture. He'd take a week and he would just read it and reread it and re just live in the scripture for a little bit, put himself into the story. And then he showed us how he went about kind of framing questions and illustrations and what were the needs of the people he loved. He just showed us all these things. And then he had us write parts of sermons ourselves and hand them in for him to examine and he would show us where to go and some things to consider and then he had us actually come up and preach in front of our fellow students and they would critique us and it was interesting it was fun but i remember at the very end of the course he said okay chris now i want you to preach at this church and i went whoa <laughs> me i'm just a kid and who am I to them? And I'm not ready for this. This is big time. It's like, can't I, just, can't I just learn more? Maybe you could hold my hand and whisper in my ear what to say. It would make me feel a little better. And he says, no, 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 Chris. We've been doing this training for four years. This is what it all comes to. You are now ready for this. Now go take this word and exercise the authority that God has given you in proclaiming it faithfully. I had to learn in that moment that I couldn't just park in the classroom though I wanted to and though I still to this day miss John. What an amazing faithful man. I knew that the whole purpose I was taking those studies for was so that one day I could come and hopefully be as faithful as he is to proclaiming the word of God and pastoring with the shepherd's heart that is found in Jesus Christ. And church, here's why I tell you this story. Some of us here today, the invitation is to come and see. And some of us it is to look at who stole Jesus from you. But for most of us here today, what Mary's life teaches us is that it's not enough to recognize and see Jesus for who he is, beautiful though it is. He then tells us to go and declare the glories of the risen Christ. Church, you have been uniquely designed as children of God. Maybe you're here today and you think of yourself so little you don't see your own self-value. Let me tell you something. He loves you intimately. He created you. He loved you enough that he came as a human being. God Almighty comes to earth as a human being to bear our sins and die in our place. So significant. That is love manifest. But church, know this, he did not just design you so that he could take your sins. He then imparted his spirit in you so that you could go with your own mission to tell people that he has risen. He's risen indeed. And on this Easter, the reminder for all of us here is that Jesus Christ, not just the person who is the crucified one, he is king over the universe, and he is king over our lives. And in a world where sin still reigns, nothing will break in and defeat it but the power of the resurrection, the resurrection of Jesus. And that's where you come in. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this incredible day. And we thank you for Easter. We thank you that you came to teach us a different way, to perform life-altering miracles, and ultimately to come to the cross. <laughs> but thank you that that's not the end of the story. Paul writes that if the resurrection did not happen, our faith is in vain. But thank you that as we look into the tomb, 
as we study it historically, critically, as we experience your Holy Spirit in our lives, we can know that we know that we know that he has risen and that he rules and reigns and that he desires to rule and reign in our lives and in the lives of those we interact with every day. We pray that we would leave here this Easter season with a heart full of gratitude, a mind full of curiosity, but also a fire in our belly to go and tell the most wonderful news of all, that Jesus is alive and that he can be known and experienced and that he can rule and reign in our lives and bring us liberty and freedom forevermore. We ask this in the power and the name of Jesus. Amen and amen.